myself up, huh? Yes, sir. All right, all right. Well, thank you, David, for organizing and bringing us together today. Give everybody, give David a round of applause. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. Um, what, you should sign up because you know why? Yes, woe can. Yeah. Do it together. Now, I'm going to ask one of these beautiful women in the front row here, beautiful ladies in the front row. They told me, uh, somebody it texted me and said, go Instagram live on our feed. So if you turn on the live on that thing, we'll be live on our Instagram. All right. Um, my name is David Peters. I am the founder uh, and executive director of the West Oakland Cultural Action Network, WOCAN, and the founder and producer of the nationally recognized Black Liberation Walking Tour. I would like to invite everybody out to take the tour. I did it this morning. So uh, if I'm extra excited, you know, you know that's the reason. I'm a third generation West Oakland resident, uh, and this tour helps to document, preserve, and transmit the black Southern rural migrant values that are so endemic and foundational to what Oakland is, was, and shall become. And so as Seneca talked about, gentrification is a erasure of culture. So I have a cultural action network, not a political network, a cultural work that is founded in the roots of so many of those black migrants that came here, that provided the values and the energy for so much of the activism that powered Oakland back in the day and continues to contribute to attract people uh, to, to, to today. Um, so I just want to take a moment, thank you for being here, Assembly Member Bonta, to recognize a few additional dignitaries. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Ambrose Carroll, head of Green the Church. He's doing international work to, to Green the Church. I see every time I look up, this brother's in another country being at the White House. <laughs> talk to, talk to uh, uh, Pastor Carroll there about uh, his efforts at Green the Church. Uh, I want to recognize Salika Thomas, who is a candidate for Oakland City Council at large. And I also want to introduce everybody to Julia Grincrock. She is, wait your hand, Julia. Julia is my partner in a whole bunch of stuff around West Oakland. Uh, she is the, uh, she's a professor at California College of Arts. And is a central organizer for uh, Oak, Oakland Allied Knowledge Against Anti-Litter. So you'll find out from her that we have a, a meeting next Saturday. Uh, to invite community, to invite community in to participate uh, in anti-litter work. Document it. What can we do? Uh, we're looking for authentic community members to take paid roles in this leadership. And you know, one of the things that happens in West Oakland, they like to come and ask us a whole lot of questions for other people's research. They don't like to pay us for that so much. So we want to make sure that we honor our community by you know, providing compensation. To those actual community members when we ask them these questions and ask them to participate in this research. All right. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my grandparents came here from Houston, Texas, uh, both former farmers from the country. Uh, they heard there was my uh, grandfather's brother-in-law heard there was work for black folks in the shipyard in Portland in 1942. They jumped in a Model T bound for Portland Ran out of gas in West Oakland in 1942. My family's been here ever since. Uh, I love this town. Um, and I really appreciate everybody being here. And we're going to do whatever that we can to make sure uh, that we stay safe and healthy and preserve this town for future generations. All right. Well, that is may be uh, a little bit. Let me be enough about me. But let me just start this off and just, just help level set a little bit. Here are some of the things that we talk about on the tour. We know in West Oakland, West Oakland has the highest childhood asthma rates in the state of California. We know that life expectancy at birth in the West Oakland zip code is 10 years lower than in the Oakland Hills. What's that, two miles away? It may be two miles away by geography, but in altitude and in life expectancy resources and everything that goes along with this, this is in a whole other dimension, right? And so we also know that in Alameda County, uh, emergency youth emergency room admissions for asthma related illnesses are 10 times not one not five 10 times higher for a black youth than for white youth and so i believe and i believe that we are here together united in this belief that this is a problem yes. 
and this cannot stand. And so we're here to help organize ourselves and to understand uh, and get some information about the causes for this, because there's many causes, and then to be able to figure out to go jointly and together, you know, what we're going to do about that. All right, so at this time, I will want to introduce our first speaker, uh, somebody who is well known in this community, who has now continues and has been for decades, a leader, an innovator, a nationally recognized expert in community environmental justice, uh, the co-founder and co-executive director of the West Oakland Environmental uh, Indicators Project, uh, Mr. Brian Beveridge. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, that very nice uh, introduction. Uh, some of you know me, many of you perhaps don't. Uh, I have been here working with my partner in crime back here, Margaret Gordon, who many of you know. Uh, she will speak as soon as I'm done. Uh, we've been at this, uh, Ms. Margaret's been at it for at least 30 years. I just got started around 2003, so I'm a newcomer. Um, and I moved to the neighborhood in 1999, and pretty soon got involved in, in uh, the Red Star Yeast Campaign, which some of you may remember. There was a, uh, a yeast factory on 5th Street right near my house. I lived on 5th Street over there. I had never worked in community organizing or community work before. Uh, I was drawn into that campaign by some real good organizers because I, I went to a meeting and they grabbed me before I could out, get out the door. All I said was, I agree with these people. And somebody <laughs> said, hey, we like what you said. So, um, And I think that's an important thing. What I started to learn there was rooms full of people make a difference. And something else I learned in that campaign, I learned it from a fellow who just passed this last week. His name was Manza Natoto. Many of you may have known Manza. Manza uh, began and, and was the director of uh, CWAR, the Citizens for West Open Revitalization, and was trying to think about how the people could revitalize this community back in the 90s. And he picked up that baton from people in the 80s and the 70s, who picked up that baton from people who like the Black Panthers. So this long series, this history of change through unity, through bringing ourselves together, has been the power of this, of this community. And uh, one of the things I learned from Mansa during the campaign around Red Star Yeast was that there was room in that, there was space in that room for every, every approach, every idea. There were people there who wanted to bring the heat and they wanted to get on the street with, the, with their banners and their bullhorns and they wanted to bring heat to that company. There were people there who wanted to get a lawsuit going. Uh, there were people there who, who more to their nature, wanted to uh, get in a room with the agency, talk about the troubles, try to get in a room with the company. In that case, it didn't happen. But talk about how things should be done, how it's supposed to work, how we're supposed to be protected by the laws and the rules. And the thing I admired about Mansa was all those people who get in a room and they could all have devolved into arguments over, no, a lawsuit's the best thing to do. No, no, we have to go out in the street and make our voices heard. No, wait, we have to be rational in conversation. And instead of, instead of allowing that struggle, Manza said, look, all y'all want to talk about a lawsuit, you go over in that corner. All y'all want to talk about getting in the room and discussing policy, go over in that corner. Everybody wants to bring the heat, go over there. Everybody is welcome. Every voice is welcome. That's how we create unity. One of the things that's destroyed movements in the past was when people started arguing over which was the best methodology. Everybody can bring their energy to this work, and that's how we win. 
That's how we win anything. If we start fighting among ourselves about which is the best approach, why your idea isn't as good as mine, why, why some way is better, stronger, smarter than the next, then we will always fall apart. And people like it when we fall apart because they don't want to see us unified. So I'm really happy to be here today because for a long time, in the area, only the area of air quality oh, no, specifically, Ms. Morgan and I have been a little bit the Lone Rangers a lot of the time in the past 25 years. Not because people didn't care about air quality, but because there's so much work to do in this community. And so if we could carry that ball, we were happy to do it while others carried other balls. <clears throat> so I could, I could talk about the issue here, but you can, there's plenty to learn about the issue and there's folders and there's material over there. I want to make sure that we are all together in this notion. The notion that my Tai Chi teacher taught me, he used to say, in the great sky of life there's room for every wing. And on the great sea of existence, there's room for every sail. And we have to hang together, and we have to allow each other to be ourselves, and we have to then allow our leaders to unify our energies for us. So, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Margaret Gordon. My partner in crime for the last 20 plus years. All right. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about being late. I was at the celebration for Moms and the Toto that Brian just got to talking about. I've been an activist since I was 16. I'm 76 years old. And I've been doing, uh, for the last 30 years, I've been here in West Oakland doing advocacy around air, water, and soil. So if we're going to start with, from the historical, uh, uh, historical place to the now, we have to go back where redlining happened and the government made it possible to have these environmental incompatibilities right. in communities like West Sofa. Right. Why is it we don't have, why is it we have all these incompatibilities and it's not spreading out all the way, all the way up to Rock Ridge, all around to the hills, all around to 580 and 13. Why, is it the, the, we, why do we have to have the three freeways the port, the Bay Bridge, the truck companies, the sh metal shredders, all in one place. And what out having an impact on our health. And I have to agree with Brian said, it's room for everybody. From dealing with the policy, from the advocacy, looking at land use, looking at zoning, looking at health, looking at where things are proximity, where things are being placed. And also, what are the mitigations? We're at the place where is that Snitcher still needs to upgrade to the level where is that they are doing no harm to West Oakland ever again. No harm. All right? We shouldn't even get a, they shouldn't even sneeze over there. All right? Not a sneeze. At this, at, at this level of technology, why is they still, why is piles of stuff uh, all through that, 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 uh, their yards? Why is they, uh, why is that, why is that they have a state? Why is that the metals are not cleaned up to the place where is there, there's no flammable liquids inside of it? Where's the technology at? If they can't clean up, they need to go. I'm not anti-business, we need the jobs, but we don't need the harm. Thank you. Here I come. <laughs> All right. Let's give Miss Margaret another hand. I'm going to thank her and, and Brian for their leadership here in this community. Not only on matters of strictly matters of environmental justice, but also just modeling leadership. The ability to bring community together to teach us how to interact uh, with these agencies 
to have developed innovative community engagement models that center grassroots local voices to provide input and to inform uh, our, our legislators um, and, our, and the rest of our communities. And so I, I, you slipped on in, Ms. Margaret, so I'm, I, didn't, I didn't see you hiding out over there because uh, certainly uh, Ms. Margaret is one, and one of our significant um, dignitaries um, and, and you know, one of my sheroes, right? I showed up at a meeting like a few years ago and she was breaking her foot off in somebody. And I was like, who is that? I got to go meet her because she is bringing the heat in an unapologetic kind of way. And so, uh, you know, Ms. Margaret, if y'all don't know, I'm sure you know now, is a West Oakland legend, a national environmental justice leader, and a co-founder and co-executive director of WOLA. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. Now, you said something that sparked, sparked my mind, and you started talking about redlining. If you come on the, uh, when you come on the Black Liberation Walking Tour, we talk significantly about redlining because it affects how West Oakland looks right now in addition to so many of our other uh, communities nationwide. And so one of the, I'm, I'm, so y'all gonna be the first ones to hear it, um, have gotten into some planning around, how many folks have read the book um, Color of Law? Right, we, what do you think about that? Fantastic, right? There's a follow-up book that uh, the authors that Richard Rothstein, Rothstein wrote with his daughter, Leo Rothstein, that, that's called just action. Anybody reading that? Yeah. 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 All right. All right. All right. All right. So we've talked to Ms. Rothstein uh, and I've talked to some other folks that live in other places. So just action talks about, we learned the process by which government uh, transferred resources from our communities to help build the suburbs and then locked in this residential, residential discrimination, residential segregation that powers everything from environmental injustice to inequities in educational funding to differences in our home values. And so while we know what happened, now it becomes what we about to do about it. And just action provides some prescriptions and some ideas about what to do about it. So we're gonna found a book club we're gonna read Just Action together, and then we're gonna develop some ideas about what we're gonna do now, because we can't change what happened in the past. We can only go forward. Yeah, so I think everybody signed up on the list. Sign up on the list, you'll get some more information about that. Uh, come and talk to me, um, and please come on a Black Liberation Walking Tour. All right, next up, we have another uh, leader in the community. Uh, another woman leader in the community. You know, we go on the tour, we talk about how many and how important um, women leaders are in our community. And so I wanna make sure that we are here today. This is not about people. This is about pollution, right? And so uh, Tazian Kwamwili is an amazing leader here in West Oakland. From West Oakland, provides support to many, many organizations outside of her work. Uh, and is highly respected and well regarded and well loved. And so she's here on behalf of Radius Recycling, former known, formerly known as Schnitzer Steel, and is our next speaker. Please give her, as a person, a warm welcome. I'm so proud today. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tassian Kwamalele. I am so honored to be here. Like Dave said, I am from West Oakland. Um, my mother still lives on Ninth and Willow, so I'm in the neighborhood almost every day dealing with her. Um, so it is great. My mother worked with Ms. Marguerite Gordon for many years on the EEC Policy Board, which originally helped develop Acorn Shopping Center. Um, so again, I'm thankful I grew up in West Oak, in Oakland Public Schools, grad, went to Martin Luther King Elementary School. My daughter went to Martin Luther King Elementary School, graduated from Oakland School for the Arts as a member of the first inaugural class before going off to college and coming back. I have been with Radius Recycling, which many of you know as Snitzer Steel for about three years now. I give you that context to say, understanding the historical points that both Miss Margaret and Dave has just mentioned, there is no way that I could work for a company that wasn't committed to trying to get it right. Um, so with, I'm just again grateful to be here. Our West Oakland facility has about 134 employees, 
66 of them are union, 80% of them are Oakland residents. So we are committed to hiring local. Um, we have invested over $50 million in technology, state-of-the-art technology to ensure that our air missions, our, sta our, um, our water treatment systems are of the highest state, right? But there's always work to be done and there are things that we're going to continue to do. One thing I really want to highlight as the Director of Educational Partnerships and our Public Affairs Leads is our continued commitment to community investments. We have invested from the Crucible to the Love Life Foundation, Youth Alive, um, First AME Church, which we know was also a historical church that burnt down earlier this year. Um, we, have been, we have continued to invest in local organizations. We are committed to community and the company is committed to serving and being a valid, good operator in West Oakland. So I know that is a little background, but I know why we are here today. Last week's fire was horrific, um, but I also recognize and understand that that was not something that we are trying to do. It's not anything that the company is intentionally trying to get wrong, right? There's an investigation still ongoing, um, but so there are gonna be many questions that we may not be able to answer. However, I believe that transparent and open communication is the start to ensuring that you know we wanna be good West Oakland residents and good West Oakland operators. So today with me, to ensure that I had some of our top leads from our company here to answer questions that may arise, I have brought our Chief of Operations, John Abair. John, just raise your hand. I have our VP of Safe, Safety, Suresh. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna mess it up, Suresh, the last right. <laughs> And then I also have our Environmental Ops um, Director, Linda Schaefer. So as we get around to questions, they will be here. They will be able to support in answering anything. But again, I just want to reiterate, just so I know there may be frustration, I know there's anger, we understand the health impacts that have happened here historically in West Oakland. Um, we we are still looking for the, un the, uh, the rooted cause of the fire. So there are gonna be questions that we may not be able to answer because of the ongoing investigation, but we are working with our regulators, our state agencies. Um, and before I put the mic down, one thing I wanna say that we are committed to a path forward. So one of the things that we do have in place um, above all of the 50, 60 million dollars that we have invested in our facility is that we are looking to fully enclose the remaining parts of our shredder as well as fully reclose the remaining parts of our shredder as well as we are committed to starting a CBA process, community benefits agreement process. I've had a conversation with council member Carol Fife and that is something that I'm looking to work with her office to ensure that we are bringing all of our environmental um, organizations and community groups together to ensure that everyone has a seat at the table. And like Shirley Chisholm said, make sure you bring your folding chair if needed to make sure that we all are there um, so that we are all engaged because that is something we wanna do. I also wanna say that if you don't have my cell phone number, get it. Dave calls me at any time. Tanya can call me at any time. I'm always accessible and our doors are always accessible, which means that I host tours 24 seven, not just for elected leaders, but also for community. We've been working directly with the West Oakland Jobs Resource Center, Oakland Private Industry Council to get clients of theirs into our facility for jobs. And they were just there over the last two months touring the facility so they are sh uh, clear on what it is that we do, how we operate, so they know that they are sending clients into a safe and productive environment. I encourage you to do the same thing. Reach out to me, schedule a tour, so you can understand what it is we really do, how we are operating, the, 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 the investments we have made in our technology, our water treatment system, um, to make sure we are, again, being great operators in West Oakland. So I look forward to your questions. You, and I look forward to a very healthy and robust conversation. Thank you. Dave? Here I come, sis. <laughs> Can you give us your phone number? Oh, yes. I will give it to you right now. It's 415-757-9444. Can you spell your very... Yep. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the number again. It's 415 757 9444 and the name is T 
A S I O N. And that's my direct cell phone number. It's not a, a patch line. You're going to get directly to me. And I definitely always encourage you to reach out now. It's about 50, 60 people here. So if 50, 60 people call me and text me, it may take me a minute to get back to each one of you. But I'll ensure you that I will call you, follow right up to you. Um, there is no, there's nothing for us to hide or any, not to be transparent and open about. I'm going to wait for any questions. Oh, okay. Oh, number 415. 757-9444. Tasi on. Thank you so much. Uh, well, come on, one more hand for Tasi on. We may not like Schnitzer, but we love us in Tasi on. And uh, all them people from Schnitzer, y'all don't have no idea what a valuable asset you have. Some of y'all know I love to talk crazy. Nah, I ain't talking crazy because Tassion is on your team today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk later, sis. <laughs> um, uh, and so we'll take questions from the audience, you know, toward the at the end of the program. So hold your questions. Uh, you know, take some notes. You know, I, I'm I'm known that I love to grill. You know, on the, on the barbecue pit. But that hopefully that ain't the only kind of grilling that we're gonna be doing here today, right? All right. So next up. Uh, I have someone that I have in a short time grown to love, honor, and respect, right? Talk about uh, a partner and rabble rousing and causing good trouble. Uh, one of the smartest people I know uh, with a lot of fire, a lot of spunk, uh, a lot of energy, and a passion for environmental justice in the community. So I came out of my house last Thursday morning to jump on my bike about 6.30 and I was immediately hit with the stench of burning plastic. And I'm like, what the hell is that? This cannot be healthy for me. And I'm about to go for a bike ride? We all know that burning plastic is toxic and deadly and does irreparable damage to you upon your first smelling it. And I'm like, is that, that's, that's got to be the schnitzer fire like two miles away from my house. If I can smell it two miles away in my part of West Oakland, what must it be like for our elders that are around the corner, around across the street? And at that point, Tanya called me. She said, Dave, let's get it together. <laughs> right? And so uh, her, it was her initiative and call that brought us here together, along with the other sponsoring organizations, uh, Environmental Democracy Project, West Oakland Cultural Action Network, uh, the uh, Oakland Cannery Collective, uh, the um, West Oakland Environment Indicators Project, and Neighbors Together Oakland. So just give a quick round of applause for the sponsoring organization. Thank you, T.O., for the pizzas today. And let me have, I have the esteemed pleasure to introduce Black Girl Magic herself, the Executive Director of the Environmental Democracy Project, Ms. Tanya Boyce. Hi. Thank you, everybody. So my name is Tanya. Um, every report card I've ever gotten says talk too much on it, so that's kind of what I go by. Tanya talks too much. Okay. Well, D Environmental Democracy Project is a solution-oriented organization that came out of my passion to be a problem solver here in the community. I don't really consider myself a leader or an activist so much. I'm really more of a problem solver. And so um, that's why I went into urban planning because I love complex problems. And then after urban planning, that's why I went to law school because that gives you more tools to deal with complex problems. And as it pertains to environmental harms, there are a number of routes that we can take. Environmental Democracy Project uses the triad of education, advocacy, and litigation in order to right environmental wrongs. So education, that's what we're all here doing today. We're getting information about the history, we're getting information about the future and what's happening, what's planned, and, and we're sharing information between each other about our impacts. Advocacy, you know, that's what WOAP has been doing for the last 20, 30 years as far as dealing with our regulators and making sure that we hold people accountable to the regulation. So we know if you break a regulation, there may be a fine. And so there's regulatory law that goes along with that. There's also this other portion that I'm gonna take just a small brief moment to talk to you about, and that's basically the 
foundation of American law, which is if you break it, you bought it, right? So if you break it, you bought it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, which is the various theories around trespass and how you get compensated when somebody hurts you. So there's these three things. There's a thing called a public nuisance. There's a thing called a private nuisance. And then there's this thing called failure to abate. And all of these are civil actions that have nothing to do with the, li the regulatory process, but are civil actions that happen for people who have direct harms done to them. The main thing that I really want to, I'm not going to walk you through the whole presentation because I gave a packet and anybody who wants to get some more detail can certainly come to the Environmental Democracy Project and we'd love to talk more about it. But the main thing that I want to make a difference between is that public nuisance, someone creates a harm, it's offensive, it interferes with the comfortable enjoyment of your life or your property, and your harm is different than that of the public at large. So what does that mean? Something specific to you, to your situation, that isn't just like everybody else. Private nuisance, that has to do with your property, right? When something is coming into your property, and it could be in the soil, it could be in the water, it doesn't have to be some something that you can see that's actually hurting your property. And then failure to abate is what happens when there is a nuisance, either public or private, that is not abated. And that has a harm to you. So we're all, I know myself, experiencing the impacts of copious forms of pollution, right? And we're also experiencing the impacts of copious things that are creating climate change, right? And, and, and increasing temperatures and the things that come out of that. What we know is that we've had one of the hottest years on record this year, and it's only gonna go up. So we can anticipate that things are going to go up exponentially. And what we really wanna do is bring the costs of regulation and the cost of non-compliance into an equal place, where it's not more advantageous to not comply than it is to. So we just are here to share information to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we all have the same tools, right? Because we, what, what, what really encouraged me to go to law school is that what I know is that other communities know more about the tools that are available to them in my community, right? So one of the main things that I love doing as a planner, as a legal scholar, is sharing what I know. Because I always assume everybody knows what I know, but it's just not the case. So knowing about all of the tools available gives us the power that we need to actually address the issues and to be on a level playing field with the regulators. And so that's the part that I wanted to add to this conversation. I wanna thank everybody, especially especially Tasia. I really appreciate that we have people who represent us in the industry. It makes all the difference in our lived experience. And I wanna thank Radius Recycling <laughs> for having us represented within your company. It really does make a difference in the ways that this comes together. I'm so grateful that you accepted this invitation with no hesitation at all and that you brought your whole team. It really does show that you honor us and, and have a lot of respect for this community and I'm grateful to have you where you are. Thank you so much for all coming out and I'm gonna hand it back to the MC now. Thank you, my sister, appreciate you. Let's give another round of applause for this time of voice in the ground. Democracy project. Democracy, mm, time to attack. Something like that. Um, I want to just take a brief opportunity here to uh, introduce a couple more dignitaries. So we have uh, Mr. Seth Stewart, who is Chief of Staff for District 1 Councilperson Dan Cow. And we have Inner Chu, who is the Executive Price President of Community Building for Abaltsi, East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation. Well, Balti is an organization that's near and dear to my heart. Um, some of y'all know, but most of y'all don't know, I am the treasurer, board treasurer for Abalti. Um, and Mabalti is the, uh, uh, Abalti manages 25% of affordable housing units in the city of Oakland. 
we manage more affordable housing units in the city of Oakland than any other entity. And we all know how important housing is and that we have a crisis of affordable housing for people in our communities. Uh, and so I would want to um, uh, encourage everybody to come out in, at our annual gala. Uh, that's gonna be on September 8th at Preservation Park. Uh, you can talk to myself or Inner uh, about any more information about that event. We'd be pleased ask you to join us. Um, Abalti also manages over 300 units of affordable housing right here in West Oakland. And so residents of our properties are key stakeholders and are affected by environmental injustices that happen in West Oakland. And so we are committed uh, to West Oakland and all of Oakland. Uh, we have projects all, all over the place. And one of the things that distinguishes the Baltic is its community, its healthy neighborhoods, community development approach. There are a number of other affordable housing developers that build buildings, a Balti builds communities. And that's why I elected to serve uh, and had the opportunity to serve on the Abalti board. Uh, my organization, WOCAN and the TOR, were fostered by Abalti through its community leadership programs. Um, and I am eternally grateful uh, for Abalti for stewarding so many uh, places in our neighborhoods. Healthy Havens Court, yes. The Healthy Havens Court co the, uh, Collaborative the San Pablo Avenue Revitalization Collaborative, the Chinatown Coalition. These are important community building organizations that go beyond the buildings, but can talk to the community infrastructure of the people and the developing leadership in place of where they are. So I want to thank again, Inner and the Abalci and the rest of the staff for the work that we do jointly. Yeah, come on, give a hand of All right, at, at this time, uh, we have an additional distinguished and esteemed speaker that we would like to introduce and come share some words with us. I'd like to introduce State Assemblywoman Mia Bonta, our representative. Now, take note of which of our elected officials are here and which ones. <laughs> thank you, David. Uh, I want to thank you all for making sure that this space was something that was happening right now. And in hearing the kind of conversation that has already happened just in this moment, I know that people are here to be solution oriented, but also to make sure that people are accountable. And one of those folks, entities that need to be accountable, I believe is the state. Every day I go up to the state capitol and I say I proudly get to represent the people, the beautiful people of Oakland and AD18. And it's important for me to be in these conversations, not to speak, I'm thankful to, honored to, but more importantly to listen. Because when we have a group of people coming together to offer solutions, then my job is to make sure that those solutions turn into actions that can lead to accountability when the state is involved. So Tanya talked about her three areas that she's focused in on. I got three tools myself. I got the bully pulpit. I have the governor I can call. I have the speaker of the assembly. I have the speaker pro tem of the Senate. I have every single legislator in the state of California that I can call upon to hold accountable. I have the phone number of every single agency head to call and say, hey, what's going on? We said we were gonna do something. We need to do it. I have the ability to focus on budget and to Seneca's point, making sure that we have the resources that we need in order to be able to make sure that West Oakland and the entirety of Oakland has the ability to thrive, particularly in moments when we can finally acknowledge the reparations that are owed, especially to communities like West Oakland. Right. So I'm gonna be focused on that as well. And then the third tool in my toolbox is legislation. 
Now, it's important to David's point to make sure that we have the kind of representation, and Tanya spoke about this too, representation that matters. And the fact that I get to say, I get to represent the beautiful people of Oakland means that you have a representative that looks like you, who knows what it's like to wake up and not breathe clean air, who knows what it's like to open a refrigerator and not have food in it, who knows what it's like to be displaced, having those conversations and putting together legislation. But I know nothing if I'm not doing that with you. So today I'm gonna listen, today, tomorrow, and every day. And I wanted to point out that Lisa Williams, who's on my team, senior field rep is here. And we have Rowena Brown, who's my district director, who is here, who's been doing a lot of work in Oakland for a long, long time. So I'm not alone. So when you see them, you see me. And you're gonna see me. Because this moment is a little bit, a lot of bit about accountability. And so when you need those three tools from me, call on me. That's what I'm here for. That's why you put me in the spot and I'm gonna hold myself to it. And I know that you all, I know you will hold me to it as well. So I'm thankful to be here with you all today. Appreciate the solution sensibility. But I know that when people are looking at everyone's face, you gotta be able to make sure that at the end of the day, we're accountable. For that little baby who woke up on Wednesday on her way to school and had her lungs so full that she did not have the ability to think when she sat down in her math class. I know that's why you all are here. That's why I'm here too. So together we can do it, thank you. All right, let's give uh, Sunday Woman Bonta another round of applause. I'm going to say it again. Recognize who's here and who is not. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to take a moment. Um, and take, you know, I'm going to take an MC privilege to be able to introduce another, bring to the stage one of our previously introduced dignitaries, Julia Grincrow. Talk a little bit to you about Oak uh, in a way to continue to be involved in environmental justice in all of Oakland. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I'm not a public speaker, so uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I'm an educator and teaching architecture in UC Berkeley and California College of the Arts. Yes. Uh, and uh, during the years that I was teaching this profession, I realized uh, how much harm this profession is responsible for. Uh, and then uh, during my education, I realized that instead of continuing to, um, to produce professionals that feed gentrification, that give tools for displacement and disenfranchising, uh, continuing the legacy of redlining in purple lining and whatever, uh, instead, we want to educate uh, students who want to help reparations, who want to support and advocate for, uh, for community healing. Uh, and, um, and I'm uh, searching for opportunities to do that. So last year, um, there, was, uh, there was a call for a training and fellowship uh, to put together a, a collective, a co community research collective uh, for climate action. And I reached out to David Peters, who was participating in many of our classes and supporting the cause. Um, and uh, David introduced me to Tanya Boyce, who you uh, heard before. And we formed a collective for, um, uh, for climate action in, uh, in Auckland, both West Auckland and East Auckland. Uh, and during this year, we were, as Tanya was saying, we were firm, fermenting uh, an idea of what this collective will be about. And we came down with the idea of uh, fighting inequity in litter management of the city. So litter can be seen as a little nuisance, like 
a cup, a plastic cup that is thrown here and there, but it can be grown to a climate uh, hazard, to something that uh, impacts every, uh, every day of every resident. Uh, so we, uh, after a year of fermentation, we are now finally ready to, uh, to launch this process of participatory action research where the researchers will not be students from Gobert's, from California uh, College of the Arts, or UC Berkeley, or any other elite academic institution, the researchers will be the residents. And their expertise, their lived experience will lead the, the research and will frame the question, will develop the methods, develop the tools. And in the end of the day, uh, we are hoping by the end of this, of this calendar year, come up with a campaign, with a white paper and campaign to the city that uh, demands a better equity-based uh, litter management reform. So uh, next Saturday, uh, we are launching a first community gathering in Third Eye Soul Kitchen on MLK, I don't remember the number. 31st or 30th, you'll see. 30th in MLK. 30th in MLK. 30th in MLK. Uh, if you signed up uh, for, there was a sign up sheet going around, we'll uh, email you the Eventbrite. We invite residents, uh, supporters, advocates to come to this community gathering. We will have no speakers. We didn't invite anybody uh, smart to, to talk to, to us. We're inviting every participant to, uh, to come and speak uh, about the issue. We'll have organized activities that uh, kind of elicit uh, strategies and invite everybody to come up with ideas uh, and we are hoping by the end of this day to have a team of uh, local researchers that we have stipends for uh, to work with us for uh, the duration of this pro uh, project. Thank you for the opportunity to, to give this message. Uh, Y'all don't know, that's my partner crime right there. I love, love, love me some Julia. Right. She's been operating down here in, in West Oakland for a few years. Uh, I initially met her through a project that, that she was doing with WOA, working with WOA. You know, WOA continues to be a pivot point for so many connections uh, that grow here in, in the fertile soil of West Oakland. And I've continued to partner with Julia over and over and over and over and over again on all kinds of uh, positive and interesting things. So please come out next Saturday. Um, and this is, this we, litter is obviously an issue in our communities, and we want to make sure we engage people from the street, from the ground level, to talk about this. There's a place for academics and experts and the smart people, but we know that people who live in communities have the knowledge and the power to understand and provide answers to our own problems. Yeah, so thank you for that. All right. I am going to uh, introduce a couple of other dignitaries that I was made aware of. Uh, we have Anna Telez from Oakland at Large Council Person Rebecca Kaplan's office. You raise your hand. There she is there. And we have Lily Moser from Congresswoman Barbara Lee's office. And very importantly, you know, we have representatives from the regulatory agencies. Um, that are here. And so I am, I'm going to say I'm like amazed, overwhelmed, and astounded that this came together in a week. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> but I guess I should not be because we all have more power individually than we think that we have. That's right. Right? That's right. And when we join together, we geometrically multiply that power and ability to influence our circumstances. So I want to, if, we, if you would just raise your hand, I want to thank uh, a representative from the department, State Department of Toxic Substances Control. That's certainly ain't Grant, y'all. Y'all is already know. Uh, there are representative or representatives from the California Air Resources Board, CARB. All right, thanks for being here, CARB. Now, Veronica. I was, I was like, I said you had a, saw you had a name tag. I was trying to figure out with the womb. Now I see that you're you with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Uh -huh, I'm just trying to keep it secret. I ain't gonna bite. 
And then we also have uh, a representative here from uh, our largest regional economic center, the Port of Oakland. Port of Oakland, who we got here from the Port? All right, and so, you know, our ability to bring together all players from the regulatory, regulatory side, um, from radius and from the community, as well as from our elected leaders, you know, shows that the community can bring together, can bring together the solutions. And so I want to thank everybody again for taking the time on such a beautiful open Saturday um, to be here um, with us on this important issue. Give yourselves a round of applause. Ah, don't get out of here if you ain't signed the sign-up sheet. You know, you got to get you got to get that ticket. Hang now, hang on. We're about to do it. Uh, don't sign on the sign up sheet. You know, you know, you know, you know. You have to get a little ticket to get out. It's easy to get in. But you got to pay to get out without that ticket. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, so please sign up on the sign up sheet. Actually, it's important. You know, you you get what you count. Right, I'm a certified public accountant by trade and training. I count for a living. Categorize, count, sort, organize. Um, and so we want to make sure that we can document the participation, and then we are able to continue the conversation by reaching out. All right, I'm supposed to, uh, it's my turn to talk here. And uh, let me just kind of, as, as uh, the good rever reverend doctor said, just let it flow. Huh? So I'm going to try and let it flow. But I am going to hang uh, a couple of uh, points of uh, fact in here. And so it may not all make sense. I'm going to try and just spit these out and then see if we can weave something together. Here. Now, there is great concern in what some folks would like to call, some what some folks call uh, late stage capitalism. And so the concentration of wealth in increasingly fewer hands leads to a concentration of power and is, I believe, is a threat, fundamental threat to our democratic systems, right? When the Supreme Court says money equals speech, those with the most money get the most speech. And so how do we as individuals, we actually have, we have to be aware of these capital pools that come together. You know, we've seen ownership of great swaths of what used to be owner-occupied housing go into the hands of a few private equity pools. One of those private equity pools is BlackRock. Y'all familiar with BlackRock? <laughs> Who is the largest shareholder in Radius? BlackRock, facts. Let's talk about some more facts here. And so I just took, you know, I'm a CPA trade and train. I love facts and figures. So excuse me if I bore y'all with some of this stuff, but I think it's important uh, to know. And we thank KQED for being so on the scene right there and helping out the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, to understand some of the history uh, of violations. This information is in your packet, but I think it's important to know and give us a chance uh, to talk about it. So as a... CPA, my tool in trade is, is SEC filing reports, Securities Exchange Commission. And so if you look in Radius's 2022 10K, that's its annual filing of financial results before the SEC, you will find something that's called risks factors, in which the company describes the risks to its operation. And so as I was reading that this morning, you know, I ran across a couple of things. Uh, so first, this 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 is scale. Schnitzer. Uh, in 2022, uh, former Schnitzer, in 2020, look, look, I'm going to just call y'all Schnitzer. You can't separate yourself from that. You, just by changing your name, you can't separate it. It may be more representative. I understand. I got you, Tazian. But just so we have a common level of understanding. Uh, this is a conglomerate that in 2022 had $1.7 billion in top line revenues. Two years later, that was in 2020, I'm sorry. Two years later in 2022, they had doubled to $3.5 billion. Uh, it's cash flows. They increased cash of increased cash by fifteen million dollars uh, last year, uh, and it's also vertically integrated. And so, one of the companies it owns is Pick and Pull. Yes. So it's a Pick and Pull. I think over over there by you, Tanya. Yes. Right. They, so they may you know. They, hey, you know, if you ever had a beater car like I did, you went to Pick and Pull, got your little parts, you know, replace your little thing thing, uh, and then after a while, they smash. It. And so I hear from understand from the people in East Oakland that they're smashing them cars over in East Oakland is an environmental problem over there. Honey. All right? Well, and then 
what they do is they can then bring them smashed cars over here to the to the Schnitzer site, uh, where they take that car and smash into chunk fish fistful size chunks of metal, and then sort it and do all that stuff that they do, uh, which leads to almost annual fires. So it seems to me that annual fires, while not intended as a result of operation by Schnitzer, is a regular and ordinary outcome of the course of business that they operate in. I question, is it possible for no matter what the level of investment is, for Schnitzer still, despite their best intentions, to be able to stop poisoning my community? And so that is the challenge for all of us here today. You know, our what, what's our motto for the day? Clean up get out. or get out. Yeah. Clean up or get out. Wait, wait, wait. Somebody say it with me. Clean up or get out. Thank you. So, you know, we go synthesis on the first part. Clean up. Yeah. That's the opportunity. But there's a promise on the second part. Amen. I'm gonna keep it clean. You got to get up out of here. You ain't got to go home. But you got to get out of here. But you got to get on up out of here, huh? Yes, sir. All right. So, um, and again, pulling from these from these risk factors, uh, I quote: increased focus on strengthening environmental compliance and enforcement in overburdened communities that may be disproportionately impacted by adverse health and environmental effects may impact our ability to obtain or renew licenses and permits for, sil for facilities in or near such communities. Hmm. Well, so I have a question to our regulatory agencies. Why? Why are they allowed to continue to make mistakes that this community pays the cost for? Oh. I would suggest to you either the enforcement of the regulations is remiss or the regulations themselves need to be corrected. So our ladies, that's where we look to our leaders at the state level to be able to bring forward the regulations that we need to protect and safeguard our communities from those who have massive piles of capital against those who, I don't say against those, in, in the presence of those who do not. This is an inevitable outcome of a system where power and speech is determined by your access to control resources. Let me give you a little bit, is that okay? Can you mind if I read you a little bit more? I'll read you a little bit more. In fiscal 2022, as a result of court orders and regulatory changes, we were required at times, see I circled the at times part, to transport shredder waste from our open facility out of state for disposal at what? Increased costs. Uh, so, uh, to take the poison out of our community, you have to ship it out of state. That costs money. Now, if I'm Mr. CEO, Chairman of the Board of Schnitzer, and I got stock compensation, I know that if I increase costs, I'm gonna hurt my personal wealth, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And so it is only operating, it makes common sense, kind of like how we got redlining to separate our communities to operate in the economic interest of those who control the organization. That's They're not trying to have increased costs. We can come out here and, and talk all we want to. When you get back into the back room, you start cutting these deals and you realize that increased costs hurts the pocket of every shareholder uh, of Radius. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District, I think we call that back man. Yeah, back man. Uh, they have a permit, they, their permit, so Schnitzer, if you know, has they're out here at the port. Uh, and you know, they, the ships pull up, skirt, skirt, pull up, and they get loaded and go in and out. So they get, how many is it? Is it how many is it? 26, is it 26 a year? 26 ships a year are there permitted uh, currently. So they've asked Backmed for variance to allow 32 ship calls. And so Backmed has not acted on our permit modification request yet, but in the interim, routinely issued agreements to permit 32 ship calls in a year. What you say? Back man, what we doing? What you say? What we doing, back man? There's a limit for 26. You have not approved their permit to go to 32, what but you're going to slip out on the under and let them have an extra six anyway. What? We know. We see you. We do our research. What? I don't understand these variances around this because if you did it, 
out in front and transparently and gave him a 32, they're getting the news. But if you give him an individual variance, you can slip on under on the, on the, on the low low. And we see, we do our research. Let's see what else we got here. All right, I think I got one more before we wrap this up and turn this over to questions. Oh, this might be the juicy part. Let me see. <laughs> The California Department of Toxic Substance Control has increased its informant actions and sought to impose additional permitting and regulatory requirements on the metals recycling industry in the state. Ooh, that sounds like increased costs again to me. And this is an organization that on, what was it, $3.2 billion in sales, only brought $15 more million to the bank. Now, if you're going to bring $15 million to the bank, how much can you really spend on cleanup? on increased costs or do you go to our regulators and say hey let me get a pass on the side side because they ain't gonna know okay right right uh so in july 2021 the epa issued an enforcement alert reflecting a national enforcement a national enforcement initiative in conjunction with state regulators focused on clean air act compliance at metal recycling facilities that operate what auto and scrap metal shredders that's y'all radius Increased enforcement. Um, we have in the past and may in the future be subject to enforcement actions or litigations by regulators or private parties that could result in additional penalties, compliance requirements, or capital investments. Sound like a whole lot of money to me that y'all ain't driving to the bottom line. Oh, by the way, see legal proceedings in part one item three of this report. So you start reading these financial reports, you find out a lot of stuff. Okay. Because the SEC requires companies to disclose this risk to its shareholders, right? So if they say something here that's not true, you will get a class shareholder class action lawsuit uh, way up to wild wild zoo, way so. And so these are excellent documents to go and see because it's got to be the truth. And if anybody in the, any company tells you what they wrote in a SEC filing is not the truth, boy, you got them. Right, the SEC don't play. Believe me, I am I used to write SEC comments. I used to write SEC reports. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up here. So, uh, it, well, I got a couple of them. In 2021, uh, EPA issue announced a joint effort to expand environmental enforcement overburden California communities. Uh, it could result in increased enforcement. So, uh, this is a rhetorical question. This can be answered later. How much has Radius budgeted next year uh, for capital improvements and cleanup here at this facility? Uh, not corporate wise. All right, so here's what, here's something that got me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try to explain this and not read through all this stuff. And so help me out, Tazian, and I'll, you, we'll, we'll go to questions. You get a chance to respond to this in a minute. Um, the state attorney general, or was it the county attorney general, had a suit against Snitzer around some stuff. State. And the DTC, DTSC would not act. I'm going to say it again. The DTSC would not act until the Oakland Athletics Investment Group. Oh, boy. And we know how wonderful them people are, right? Uh, had to sue our own state agency that's supposed to represent the interests of the people to do enforce the regulations they already have on the butt. And I'm going to summarize and help me out. You chance to help me if I get this wrong. So I think there were two findings in there. One is that uh, light, the, 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 uh, light fibrous materials. Is this metal? Is that the metal particles? So it looks like dust, and it float around the air, and it get down in your lungs, right? Yeah. So it get down in your lungs, and anybody that's downwind for just been breathing this for years, you tell me that don't have a health effect, right? And so they got, they were permitted to re to release this. DTSC came along and said, stop. And then it went to court and they turned around and they got a waiver. And despite, and there's a question about the findings legally and technically about whether it's hazardous or not. But you know, communities have common sense. Okay. Do you think light fibrous material breathing in your lungs is harmful? Mm -hmm. I don't care sure what the regulators say, right? We got common sense out here. Nope. And I think the other issue is whether the waste from there is classified as hazardous waste. And so it was declared to be hazardous waste. It was shipped out of state. Our regulating agency gave them a, okay, like them waivers. Gave them a waiver in the past again. And now this stuff is going out in their community. Now, Radius could say, 
even though we are not legally required to do this stuff, we're going to stop fighting because we hear the community and understand that maybe this, our state of science hasn't gotten to the point where we can detect this stuff and we will take it upon ourselves to do better by y'all. It's always a better choice to choose to do better, right? And now that we all know better, we all gonna do better, right? So I'm gonna wrap this up here with this ending statement. Clean the hell up or get the hell out of here. Oh yeah. Woo. Thank you. Alright, now I'm putting my MC hat back on. Uh, where am I at? I think now is the time for me to introduce, bring back up Seneca, and we are going to take questions uh, from the audience. Thank y'all. I'm still up here. Yeah, I'll keep it to a minute or less if you want to make a combination of a statement to ask question or if you want to just make a statement um, try to keep it concise to allow for as many speakers uh, as possible all right raise your hand who's all right. first all right I'm, I'm gonna walk to you I'm gonna walk to you all right just tell, you, tell us your name first too hi everyone my name is planet MC I'm an environmental rapper but I'm also a middle school teacher here in Oakland Yay! give it up if you went to school here in Oakland so I'm also a football coach here in Oakland and a mile away is where we play football at McClyman's High School with kids as young as 11. And when this fire happened last Wednesday, our kids didn't even know. So all the elected leaders here, state representatives, Schnitzer, we've got to come up with a better system so it doesn't happen again. And if it does, we deal with it the right way. We communicate and let our families know. Because like earlier, Mia Bonta said, we've got babies yes. who were breathing this in. Yes. And when I went to school the next morning, that Thursday morning, I asked my students, and this breaks my heart to say it out loud to all of you, I asked them, I said, did you notice the fire? And there are students at my school who went to Prescott and none of them knew about the fire. So no one knew to close their windows. No one knew to protect themselves because our system here is broken. In other countries, they have these kind of plants away from residential areas, away from schools so that we can be safe and the kids can grow up without getting asthma. Thank you. Thank you, Flat MC. I appreciate you. All right, I'm gonna move on over to our next question or a comment or a statement, and I have your com you have your timer right here. All right, thank you. It's time to go. My name is Iris Corina, and I live on uh, 10th, 9th and Market in Oakland. At 7.02 on the day of the fire, I was at the gas station. And because of what's happening in Hawaii about that fire and people weren't notified, I drove over there because I didn't hear fire engines, I didn't hear ambulances, I heard nothing. So I drove, I have COPD, but I was thinking about my community. And so I went there and there was a guard there. And she said, you gotta turn around. And I said, well, where are the fire trucks? I called channel two and they said, yeah, we are aware. I said, but where are the fire trucks? So I wanna thank Barbara Lee's office because that office, the only office that provided me with information of who to contact, I didn't know who to contact. I took pictures of it. I drove back home and the black smoke covered my neighborhood and I didn't know what to do. I'm saying, I called the mayor's office, what, what should I expect? And I'm so happy that everybody put this together because I'm still having problems. I, have, I went to the doctor, I'm having problems, but the thing is, what should we expect? And like I said, I said, even sent the mayor an email, where's the alarm system? That I found at 722 on TV after I got home that we should stay in place, close our windows and our doors or leave the area, but it's not toxic. I'm having problems with my eyes, my throat, my ears, headaches. It's not toxic. So I know everybody says clean up or get out. I say get the hell out. And your name? Iris Corina. Thank you, Iris. All right, who's next? Uh, let me walk over here. Excuse me. Yeah, I woke up with a headache. Anybody else wake up with a headache the next day? Yep. 
for migraine. I don't be getting no migraines all day long. I had an attitude. If I if I talk to you that day, I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. Uh, Juan Villa Romero, I have one question for Radius. Um, do you have an exit plan? Have you considered other locations where you can run your operations that is not in West Oakland? And whether you have an exit plan? Uh, and for Tanya, um, what sort of evidence can the neighbors collect to build the case? Thank you. All right, you're quick. All right, who's next? No other questions, comments, concerns? All right, all right. Excuse me. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, she, he, I wanted to respond to your question. Um, there is no exit plan for us to leave West Oakland. We've been here 50 plus years, nearly 60 years. So we are not looking to leave the community. Um, and we will continue to work to advance our technologies and to be a good operator. I think this is the start of having transparent and open conversation to hear your concerns. But I think that this is also a two way street for you all to actually come in and really understand what it is we do so that when we have these conversations, the narrative is, is we have a good foundation of what exactly is happening. And so again, I welcome you all for that after this conversation. I also wanted to acknowledge the teacher and thank you for the work that you're doing and note that we work directly with McClymonds, Mr. Clayton, Mr. Evans um, with the Engineering Academy and I was in direct communication with him when this happened. Um, so yes, thank you. Thanks, Tazia. Hi, and as far as your, your question about the type of evidence, that's a great question and one that requires a much deeper conversation than what I what this man is going to allow me to have time to say. But what I will say is that Environmental Democracy Project is dedicated towards getting that kind of information into the public's hand. And so we'd like to have a workshop specifically to talk about that and to and to increase uh, edification around those issues. And if you've signed up, you will get on our, our mailing list and get more information about where you can learn that. Tanya, can I piggyback on that real quick? Um, to, I think this is this may be appropriate transferable. So you you heard next Saturday, we're having a gathering around, a, I can't say it, a participatory action research project. And so while it's a different topic, I think perhaps the tools and methods uh, can be learned can begin to be exposed in that meeting. So if you're interested in exactly what you said, how do we begin to gather evidence? We're gonna have a meeting Saturday that talks about uh, evidence, gathering evidence in a different context. Please come out. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Talika Thomas, and um, to be honest, I didn't even know anything about it. So I wanted to know if we could have like Amber Alerts set up. Um, I wanted to know if we will be able to have Amber Alerts so that it can go to um, our phone. And I know that in Richmond, when they have problems like that, they received a lawsuit, they received checks. So I feel like people should be able to receive checks anytime that happened because if people receive checks, then they'll make sure that it don't happen again. So, Salika, that's, that's, that's important. Uh, go ahead and give a clap. Amen. I like that. All right. Uh, so I remember, I remember when Chevron did it, did it catch on fire, did it burn something. Big old, it was major fire. I think smoke blew all over Richmond, and I believe as a result of that, Chevron was acquired to pay to put in place a phone system yes. that dialed all of the houses in the neighborhood to alert you that something had happened. Boy, that sounds like that's something that should have been adopted by Radius years ago. My name is Carol Wyatt, and um, I guess I just want to just make a comment because I found out about the fire from Zenny 62 on Twitter. Okay. And it was not funny because I was like, what the hell is this fool doing today? You know, because we follow Zenny. And it was really shocking to learn that that form of media had already hit the grassroots, right? The people who watch other people. So I want to know what Radius is gonna to do to offset that. Because I understand they're under investigation now and they can't talk about it, but what are you gonna to do to get ahead of it? Because we're watching, it's not, you can't hide it. And even if it's not on the news, even if you have to call Barbara Lee's office to find out, <laughs> we knew about this, because the optics. 
So my question in essence is what are they doing as far as the fire drill type of performative thing that we need done, which is to get ahead of this. So not only does it not happen, but they need to offset the media because the PR, I don't care. I work in advertising, baby. We create the narrative. So if you don't, even if you sell it to us, we ain't necessarily going to buy it. So I want to know what they're going to do about that. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone here qualified to answer yes, that question? Yes. Okay, I thank was going to say, as far as, I don't know if you were referring to the alert system, but I know AQMD sent out the alert as it related to the fire and where it stood after they came on site. So, um, but I did take notes about what they are saying about a potential phone system or something of that nature that we need to go back and have conversation about. I can't say like, yes, that's something we can do, but I think that that is something that comes, that's coming in this conversation. And also, like I stated, we are going to start a community benefits agreement process and these sort of topics are should be a part of that conversation but to specifically get to your question about protocol and drills and stuff I'm going to let our VP of safety Suresh answer you so you have a more robust answer thanks Tassion hi everyone um, appreciated all the comments and certainly we're taking notes as well because you know every time there is an incident and it doesn't matter if it's a fire um, an injury, whatever, on site, we take them all very, very seriously. And, you know, we have 3,500 employees working for our company. And we have, you know, a significant number of contractors as well. We want every single one of them to go home every single day without being harmed. And the people who are probably at the greatest risk of any of, of health hazards are our employees. So we have to ensure, and through OSHA, who regulates us as well on the safety side, we monitor the, the air, the dust, the noise of, that could impact the health of all our employees. So it's really important to us that you know, everyone goes home safe. They live in these communities. And so we want to make sure that they are they're safe. So when it comes to emergencies and drills, you know, we take that very seriously and we work very closely with the fire department and other emergency services as well. Uh, we have the fire departments come onto our property so they know what, if we do have a fire, how they're going to deal with it. And they advise us how best to deal with it. You know, the first thing they say is, is if you have a fire, what's the first thing you do? Call 911. So within two minutes of the fire actually being identified, we got on the phone and called 911. Six minutes later, the first fire truck appeared and started to help us deal with the fire. It was a big fire and it did start and it needed more trucks. And we also had some fire boats um, support the, the, the incident commander and the, and the response. But we practice those drills. So we know that every employee knows what to do and really, it's about safety as well, right? Now, one of the uh, suggestions that you have come up with is a sort of notification into the community. We're going to take that seriously and see what we can do about that. We have to work with the incident commander that's typically the fire department chief or the battalion chief. But let's see. We'll take that away. Okay? Thank you. Um, and thank, and thank you for that answer. I really, really appreciate um, the number of leaders of a local facility that's been sent there. I'm, I'm going to let you go. Just one comment. So you called 911, and they answered the phone. <laughs> I didn't call 911 three times. I got a recording, and it roll, rolled over and over and over. To the point, one time, I just hung up the phone and didn't call back. So that's a whole other thing, but let me shut up. Uh, Max, go ahead. 911 is a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing I want to say before my comment is we have a part of our website, woeip.org slash fire impact. fire impact. You can go there. We're documenting people's experiences of the fire. What you smelled, what you heard, what happened to you. So we want to get a full documentation of that. Um, but I do have a question, and I think it's wonderful. You know, folks come here and they're trying to be solution oriented. So somebody says, well, we should have a warning system. Uh, you know, I would say, why don't you have an on-site fire brigade that knows how to handle toxic fires? Because everybody keeps missing the point. This is a fire 
I think it wasn't in your steel pile. I think it was in your waste pile, uh, wherever it was. I don't know how steel burns, but uh, there was something in there that caused it to burn. My real question is, why is there fires? Now, I will tell you that five years ago, I was in meetings up at DTSC's office. Your CEO or vice president was there with a bunch of lawyers. I was the only resident who was invited into those meetings. I raised the issue of fires. I was told, I was told there's nothing you can do about it. Now, that to me means fires, toxic fires, are a component of your business model. Yeah. So I'll, I'll yeah. just say, here's a talk to use this one, Brian. You might be covering them, Steve. Maybe. So if to toxic fires are a component of your business model, that seems unacceptable. Um, and I want to. I would like to know, uh, not whether you're going to send me a text. I'd like to know what you're going to do about toxic fires happening, because they because they happen and have happened typically every 18 months for the past decade. Wow. At least. Unacceptable. So fires, fires in a pile of toxic material could be a never event for, an or for a corporation. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a death due to accidents in a hospital. Never should happen. Yeah, right. Toxic fires at your business should never happen. And if you're not going to deal with it, if you're going to tell us, oh, it's a flashlight battery in the glove compartment, I think you should find the flashlight battery. If you're, you know, if you're going to say, if you own the supply chain, which includes the scrap yards where the cars come from, I think you can figure out how to make your supply chain safer. So, so that's my question. Do you have any plan? Do you have anything in mind to solve the problem of fires? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you do you have an answer? If so, you got one minute. <laughs> All right. All right. So I got a minute. So one of the first things we do, we inspect every load that comes onto our site. We have to ensure that we, there are no prohibited materials coming onto our facilities, asbestos materials. We are looking for batteries. We're looking for propane cylinders. We're looking for all the things that potentially could be combustibles. We do not want fires. Fires are bad for our employees. They put them at risk. They put the community at risk. It's not something that we want, and we are doing all we can from trying to eradicate it before it comes onto site, if it comes onto site, rejecting it, and then making sure that all our employees know what to do if a fire does take place. So you're saying these things hasn't happened already? We do have fires and we are trying to prevent them. We, and we'll continue to do that. The investigation is underway. The learnings we get from that investigation, we will apply. We will apply it across all our operations. All right, last question. Oh no, I think you were first, sir. Yeah, but you you're first. Sorry about that. My apologies. Hi, Vic Douglas from the Bay Area Quality Management District. I um, had a question regarding the fires. Recognizing that this fire is under investigation, you've had fires in the past, they've been investigated. What are the results of those fires? What are the lessons learned? And have you put those in place? And what are you doing? And can you show, let the community and the regulators know what you have done and learn from those fires and the best management practices that you have changed and implemented to, to do your best to make sure the fire doesn't happen again? Yep. Uh, I, I like that. Um, I would say apologies. When I was growing up, my mother told me apologies come with behavior correction. So can you be ultra clear about what corrections you're going to make? Not that you are fire, but that you actually have a plan and what that plan is. So, um, yes, yeah. so I have stated there. Is there a mic up there? No, there isn't, but can you hear me? Oh, you can grab the mic that's, that's uh, right there, that's plugged up manually. Got it. Okay. Can you hear me? So, this loud? It's a little loud, and I have to hear I can talk loud. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So, yes, we have, like I stated earlier, we have made, it's, over the last five to 10 years, there's been $50 million in investments for air quality, emissions, stormwater treatment, and there are more to come. The initial, right now, the path forward is we are looking to fully enclose the rest of our shredder, which would include the, the additional storage of materials that sits on the outside. But to give you even more context and depth, so you have answers and you don't feel like we're just giving you fluff, I am going to, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, I am going to 
turn this over to our Chief of Operations for our enterprise, John Abier. Yeah, thank you. So, great question. And, um, you know, I can confidently answer that, you know, we continue to adapt and, and adjust our fire protocols based on best industry knowledge, meaning that we just, just don't rely on what, what is available within the Radius Recycling Organization. We lean into industry experts, we lean into consultants, all of those individuals, and ensure that what we have in place is the best available technologies and the best available training for our people. That includes things like pile segregation, the size of the piles that we have. It includes fire monitors on site, fire monitors, improved water supply to support the uh, local fire departments in the event that they come on, pile monitoring, where we check the, the temperatures. We have um, electronic devices that measure pile temperatures, and if they come outside of range, there's alerts. All of that technology is available. We are constantly looking for the best way that we can. Certainly, we don't want fires. It's not good for the community. It's not good for, for the business. We understand that, and we continue to move forward. Thank you. Last question. Um, here you go. Make it worth it. I know, my name is Erica Gleason. I live um, in North Oakland, uh, Calves District. Um, it seems to me big picture wise that fires like this that happen with alarming regularity, um, it seems like it's just part of the cost of your doing business. And you might be fined by the state or by Cal OSHA or by the Air Quality Management District. But the bottom line is, it would appear that for what was Schnitzer Steel, that's just the cost of doing business. And I just want to say that I wish there were accountability on higher levels. I don't think that uh, the, the residents of West Oakland should be punished this way, but I do think that there should be punishment for your CEO and your COO, no offense, um, other than just paying a bill, other than just paying a bill that likely at the end of the year is a tax write-off for the same company. Is it been criminal, criminal stuff? Right? Y'all want to weigh in on that? I, stuff? No? It's okay. All right. Um, I I'm just a, wanted to add really quick, Seneca, we do, I hear what you're saying and I take all your comments to heart, but I just want you to know we do not think of this as this is the cost of doing business. And I'm just gonna take it back to the beginning of what I stated in my initial comments. I'm from this community. I live, my mother lives on Ninth and Willow. I'm here almost every day visiting her. I could not work for a company that wasn't really committed to trying to get it right. I wouldn't be able to stand in front of you today knowing that I was raised here, that my daughter was raised here. If I didn't believe the individuals here, our, our chairwoman is the CEO that runs, a woman that runs this company, wasn't committed to trying to get this right. So again, I encourage you all that this starts with open communication, but it also starts with you truly understanding and knowing what it is that we do, how we operate. I have given my number out, I will give it out again. We can set up tours, that way you can see it for yourself and ask questions while you're looking at it. I'm a visual learner, I need to see it and not just talk about it. And so I would encourage all of you to take advantage of that. Um, and yes, so I will leave it there because I know we're wrapping up on time, but thank you all for being here. Okay, thank you everyone for coming out. We have media here that's gonna stay and ask questions to people after. Um, but I want to say a few parting words so we don't leave with this tension. So everybody take a deep breath. Take a moment to reflect on some solutions. We have a lot of smart people in Oakland. You don't have to work for a sister steel to come up with solutions. If you have the knowledge, skills, and ability to help in this problem, um, please direct your ideas to the uh, organizers of this event. One thing I would like to say to you all is this event happens commonly throughout the state. So again, course correction, what are you going to do differently than what you're doing now? I did not hear that today. So I challenge you to come up with those answers very, very, very soon. Um, thank you all, my name is Seneca Scott. I am the, thank you, founder of Bottoms Up Community Garden and 
Neighbors Together Oakland, um, host and co-sponsor of the event. You can get some literature from us up front. Please sign up to sign up sheet. Thank you again for all the elected officials, our staff and employees from Schuster Steel for coming and making themselves available. Um, that is, that's not easy. And they're doing more than people that we elect and pay money are doing. So thank you. I do appreciate that. That's great. And it should be commended. Um, so give them a, a heartfelt round of applause. It's not easy to come and do that. And we're going to find a solution together, I, I hope and pray. Uh, thank you all for coming. Be safe. And God bless you.